Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Kennedy. I'm the trustee chair in Chinese business and economics here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our program, China's New Government Takes Over, Takeaways from China's Annual Legislative Session. Uh, and I'm delighted that we are co-hosting this with CSIS's China Power Project, and with the Freeman Chair in China Studies. Um, I am joining you today from Beijing, where I've just arrived for a week of meetings. And um, unlike previous trips from a few months ago, the air is just delightfully horrible, but I'm still able to breathe enough to uh, participate in tonight's uh, program, which is really uh, gonna uh, try and break down what happened in China's most recent legislative session, or what's called the two sessions, when the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference met earlier this month. Uh, one of my general takeaways is what we saw the, is the four, is the completion of the construction of the Xi Jinping system of governance uh, in which the party plays a much greater role. There's less space for civil society. Uh, you see a, a more assertive foreign policy advocated, changes in economic policy, a whole variety of different things. Uh, now, that's just my take. And what I've uh, luckily, I'm joined today by a really fantastic group of China experts on multiple aspects of the economy, politics, foreign policy, and governance who are going to give their perspectives on uh, what they saw happen over the last few weeks and where China is headed. Uh, what it means for the rest of the world in terms of the global economy, uh, mm. international security, uh, and everything in between. Let me introduce uh, the my my partners for uh, today's program. Uh, then I'm going to turn it over to each of them who will make uh, remark opening remarks on whatever aspects of the two sessions uh, they would like. Uh, we've coordinated a little bit in advance, so there will be some differentiation on topics. Um, then uh, we are going to have uh, a Q&A session in which all of you uh, watching uh, can contribute questions and to the discussion. Uh, if you go to the homepage for this event, you'll see a button you can click to enter your questions. And uh, uh, my colleague, Jude Blanchett, the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS will moderate the Q&A part of the program and then close things out. But let me first introduce everybody who is with us uh, today. And I'm gonna do so in the order in which uh, they're gonna be speaking. Uh, first, uh, Jamie Horsley, who is Senior Fellow of the Paul Tsai China Center at the Yale Law School. Her research centers around examining administrative law, the governance and regulatory reform, uh, including promoting government tra governance transparency, public participation, and government accountability. And she was formerly executive director of the Yale China Law Center. Uh, and it, next, uh, Bonnie Lin, uh, my colleague here at CSIS, who is a senior fellow for Asian Security and director of the China Power Project. Prior to joining CSIS, Bonnie was acting associate director of the strategy and doctrine program of RAND's project uh, with the Air Force and a political scientist at RAND as well. Next, we'll hear from Manoj Kalorami who is a non-resident senior associate in the Freeman Chair and the chairperson of the Indo-Pacific Research Program and a China Studies Fellow at the Taka Shashila Institution. His research interests include Chinese politics, foreign policy, approaches to new technologies, and addressing questions of how India can work with like-minded partners to deal with the challenges presented by China's rise. And he is joining us today from Bangalore. Then we'll hear from uh, Jude Blanchett. Uh, Jude holds the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Previously, he was Engagement Director of the Conference Board's China Center for Economics and Business in Beijing, 
where he researched China's political environment with a focus on the working of the Communist Party, which is certainly going to be useful for today's discussion. Uh, prior to joining the conference board, he was assistant director of the 21st China Center at the University of California, San Diego. So luckily, I have brought a great group of troops with me to break down uh, what happened over the last uh, few weeks in China. Uh, and let me turn it over uh, to them. We're going to start with Jamie Horsley uh, and then go on uh, to the others. So thank you all for being with us. Your, uh, everyone who's watching is, is going to be treated to a fantastic conversation. Uh, Jamie, over to you. Well, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me to be here today. It's very exciting. Uh, I only have seven minutes. So I'm going to get started right away. Uh, I have a lot to say. So I'm going to be talking more about the governance aspect and reacting a bit to a, that piece, Scott, that you and your colleagues put out uh, about called the completed construction of Xi Jinping's system of governance, in which it stated that she has now absorbed the entire governmental apparatus into his orbit and direct control. And in fact, I have a slightly different takeaway. I was pretty relieved to see that, in fact, that did not happen. Uh, at this NPC and under the big restructuring plan. <clears throat> the main takeaway is that in spite of increasing party oversight of traditional state institutions and functions, unlike what happened in 2018, which really was a massive restructuring, we did not see major additional absorption of state institutions by the party. The only exception to that was that the state councils Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office did get merged into a new party commission, the Central Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, which looks like it'll be directly under the Central Committee, like the party Taiwan Affairs Office is right now. So we'll see how that works out. But most of the major state institutions we saw restructured were not put directly under party control although there's some novel new arrangements, um, like the Ministry of Science and Technology was restructured to hive off a lot of its functions like oversight of specific projects, you know, in the line ministries doing more coordination to develop a tech innovation ecosystem. But it was made, the, the ministry as a whole was made the working office of a new party commission on science and technology. So this is kind of a novel structure. Usually some of these, party commissions might have an office in an existing state you know, ministry, but never have I seen an entire ministry become the administrative office of a party commission. So we'll see how that does work out. But otherwise, a lot of state regulators we saw were upgraded in status, the securities regulator, intellectual property, and this petitions bureau, which I may not have time to talk about, but it's a very interesting piece too, were moved up to become directly subordinate to the state council and given more administrative authority. We also saw some new state institutions created. One was the, the others may talk about this more, the state administration of financial regulation. Um, doesn't have an official English translation yet, but I call it that because the Chinese name is exactly like the state administration for market regulation, which we call SAMR. So I call this SAFR, but it may end up with a different name. Um, and it's been accorded a higher administrative status than its predecessor, the China Banking Insurance Reform Commission enjoyed. Uh, but it's also been made answerable now to another new party commission, you know, on a, fi a central financial commission too. Um, but both of the, the other one, the new one that was created and similarly put on, within the state council structure is the new National Data Bureau, which we can also talk about more maybe in the Q&A. But given the importance of data and this digital economy to the party leadership, I was surprised and relieved to see that this data regulator was put under the sort of economic planner or promoter, the National Development Reform Commission, and it was put under as a fairly autonomous, what's called a national administration under a ministry. And it's given its own website, its own administrative authority to some degree, some autonomy, um, and it doesn't seem to have a line reporting yet to a party institution, although I'm still waiting to see the party org chart come out. We've seen the state council has issued its state council org chart, which is very useful in clarifying some of these um, relationships, but not yet the party one. Um, but 
you know, at the, again, I thought this was a good, you know, move. Now, obviously, this is a party state. So all these state institutions are subject to varying degrees of control or oversight by party institutions. Um, but because they're administrative institutions, they operate under this whole framework of administrative law, which requires agencies to be more transparent, allow public participation in rulemaking and decision making, and imposes a degree of accountability by giving remedies. You know, you can appeal against a decision by one of these agencies, or you can take them to court. You may not win very often, but you know, somewhere between 15 and 20% of the time, people do. So it's not worth nothing. Um, does this ultimately make any difference in the new era of one party and seemingly one man rule? I argue that it does. I think the state still holds. In the ordinary course, the PRC operates like a normal state. You know, it's got to deliver economic development. It's got to protect its citizens through various mechanisms, including a degree of rights and resource protection, welfare safeguards, and the like. Under Xi, we've seen the courts become increasingly professional and neutral, although not independent of the party, but they are becoming more accessible. People are using them. And they're also more transparent, although, again, the degree of that varies depending on what party Pretty interest might be involved. But in 2018, with that restructure, we saw these numerous institutions merged with the party, which takes those institutions outside of this administrative structure. So like the Cyberspace Administration of China, which is the main regulator of online stuff and still seems to be in charge of, you know, privacy, um, data, you know, cross-border data transfers and the like is a very opaque regulator and is not subject to these administrative remedies I mentioned. Now, to be sure, under this um, new restructuring, the party did you know, create new commissions and it has imposed somewhat novel ways of overseeing things, but we can talk more about that um, in practice. We'll have to watch and see how this plays out. Um, but the main point is, I think we need to also distinguish between party leadership and party control. You know, party would love to control everything, but it can't. It's got 1.4 billion people. It's got these, you know, ministries and bureaucracies that set up. It's given them goals to carry out. And while officials in the bureaucracies have to be loyal to she and the party, they also have to deliver on those economic or development goals, et cetera. So it you know, remains a sort of tension between the party and the state, which we've seen all along uh, forever in China. Um, I'm through with my seven minutes. The other point I sort of wanted to mention, which I will, is that while the MPC meetings are indeed pretty ceremonial, just rubber stamping, as they say, decisions previously made by the party, again, I argue and see that the MPC itself as an ongoing institution continues to develop its professionalism uh, and it's allowing it more discussion and debate going into it. So I don't see it as a sort of moribund, you know, uh, dying sort of state institution as well. And one of the party uh, commissions that was set up or new under the party plan, they set up a new delegates affair commission within the MPC. And its whole focus is to improve the functions of these party delegates, which are elected you know, coming up through the people and wanting to make them closer to their constituents so they get better feedback from what people are thinking about these laws and policies they're passing at, at the front. So the takeaway is, of course, China is a party state, but the state piece is still very important. Uh, and they operate in, and part of it's because they operate in a more transparent and accountable ecosystem and because they have to deliver on state goals. We'll stop there and turn it over to. Bonnie. Thank you, Jamie. So I'll cover uh, broadly a couple of major topics related to foreign policy. Uh, I'd like to start off by looking at broader foreign policy. So during the two sessions, we saw Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gong stated that China will press the acceleration button on diplomacy. And since then, we've seen a wide range of efforts that China has taken. Let me flag a couple of them, and I'll go into detail on um, maybe some of them. Uh, so first thing uh, I think it's important to know is that when Xinjiang was talking about major diplomatic events this year, he flagged two that we need to pay attention to that will occur in China. 
uh, the first China Central Asia Summit, and the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation. We also know that is, um, China seems to be increasing its effort, particularly in the global south and um, near at, at the end of the two sessions. And since then, we've seen uh, Xi Jinping announce the Global Civilization Initiative. This appears to build on uh, the Global Development Initiative, which focused on uh, development issues, the Global Security Initiative that focuses on um, international security issues, particularly peaceful resolving disputes, and it appears that the Global Civilization Initiative is focused on values and development models, right? It calls for, quote, the respecting of diversity of civilizations, advocate, advocating the common values of humanity, and valuing the inheritance innovation, innovation of civilizations, and strengthening international people-to-people -people exchanges and cooperation, end quote. Right? So what we're looking at could be um, an initiative that China is putting forward to shape values, norms in the international system, which would be a bit more forward leaning than what we've seen so far from the other two initiatives that seem more focused on economic issues mm -hmm. or more focused on security issues. Um, with respect to relationships with the United States, at the top, uh, I wanna highlight a couple of things. So first, no change uh, in China's assessment of its external environment. Um, how um, volatile it is, how challenging it, it is. But we did see for the first time during the two sessions, Xi Jinping explicitly calling out China, um, uh, sorry, the United States by name. So he said that, uh, quote, Western countries led by the United States have implemented all round containment, encirclement, and suppression of China, which has brought unprecedented severe challenges to the country's development. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty new for, for uh, China to be so, and particularly Xi to be so explicit and likely reflects their assessment of a more negative trend in US-China relations, as well as more willingness on China's end to be uh, direct uh, and frank about that, about what it views as the US challenge. Uh, we also know that probably is also a reflection of the fact that uh, President Biden also called out Xi Jinping by name during the State of the Union. As, as the two sessions were closing, we saw reports that um, US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, mentioned an expected call between President Biden and President Xi. Um, and what's interesting was the Chinese foreign ministry response to that, right? The Chinese foreign ministry response is that it is necessary to maintain communication, but they also had a line in there, which is communication should not be carried out for the sake of communication. And the U.S. side should show sincerity, work with China to take concrete actions to help bring China-U.S. relations back to the right track. I think this is an example of China being more uh, imposing conditions for U.S.-China engagement, but also it seems more reluctant than before uh, to uh, be as willing to engage based on what, it had, what, what it's seen as, ha as happening, particularly in the last couple of months. We've also seen at the same time the Chinese side noting that U.S. sanctions, for example, on China's new defense minister, Li Shangfu, is likely to bring extra trouble from their perspective to mill mill relations. So um, I, I think the Chinese are not necessarily that optimistic or from their, their Ministry of Foreign Affairs statements that eager to engage the United States without seeing from their perspective progress on U.S. Uh, um, addressing some of China's concerns. Uh, with respect to um, uh, Russia, I'll touch very briefly on this because Xi Jinping is still on a uh, on the day two of a three day visit uh, to Russia. I'll just note that it's very important that uh, uh, that Xi Jinping's first visit after the two sessions and as his third term as president overseas is to Russia, and that signals how important China views Russia with respect to its overall relationships, and it also means that as we look to what's happening, we'll likely see China being continue to elevate relations with Russia. And we should be very cautious and closely monitor what China is trying to do on Ukraine. The last issue I'll touch on before wrapping up uh, is uh, Taiwan. What we're seeing now is a sense of two sessions, but I would say actually a little bit before that is a more differentiated China's two-prong approach to Taiwan. So on one hand, we're seeing uh, softer elements that China is reaching out more to Taiwan. On the other hand, what we need to what we need to closely observe in the coming uh, weeks is whether there will be a much harder element. 
So on the softer element, we're seeing resumption of direct flights to China, um, including over two dozen cities now between China and Taiwan, compared to just four. Um, we also see the recent announcement that uh, uh, Taiwan, former Taiwan President Ma Ying-jeou will be visiting China next week for a 12-day visit. I think the 12-day visit starting on March 27th is significant because the visit will occur before President Tsai Ing-wen does her transit of the United States, and, and Ma's visit will end after Tsai has come gone back to Taiwan. So it's in many ways China trying to wrestle the narrative away from the DPP and away from the current Taiwan government to set their conditions or relations of cross-strait relations. So we'll need to see how that plays out. But as, you, as folks know, we're all also watching how China might respond to um, President Tsai Ing-wen's transit of the United States and her potential meetings there. And we'll have a better sense of what that means in terms of the if China will be adopting a harder approach uh, in terms of what pushing back against what they view as Taiwan independence. Um, so I'll wrap up here and I'll just note one thing on the defense budget, which I think folks are already tracking. Uh, China's defense budget is 7.2% increase a minor increase from the prior year, 7.1%, but it reflects the problematic security environment and it reflects what I mentioned in terms of its assessment of US-China relations. Uh, so with that, let me turn to Manoj to uh, elaborate on any points that you would like to add. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, thanks, Cotton. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. Um, uh, there's lots of things that's, uh, that's lots that's already been said, and I agree with a lot of what's been said. Uh, I have about five points that I wanted to make, um, and I'll try and add a little bit from an Indian point of view uh, in terms of how the two sessions were viewed in India. Uh, but before that, I think the first point that I want to make, and this is fairly obvious, uh, is about Xi Jinping's authority. I think throughout the week, what one saw was that there was significant propaganda around him being the man of the people. Um, that projection of that image uh, continues uh, extremely strongly. Um, there was, uh, you know, he was obviously re-elected unanimously, which is not new. The, it was the same case in 2018. Um, if you look at Li Keqiang's work report, he mentions Xi Jinping 14 times, uh, and he credits him uh, as being the fundamental cause and his thought being the fundamental important scientific guidance that led to China overcoming the challenges of the last few years. Um, this message was reiterated across the top brass of the party. So in all of the meetings, uh, delegation meetings that the Politburo Standing Committee members, the vice chairs of the Central Military Commission, and the members of the CMC, all of them reiterated this point, uh, that this is something that is critical. Uh, so I think that that uh, degree of political reinforcement from the top uh, continues. Uh, and I think that's something that is important to note, given that periodically we will talk, we will hear things about uh, factionalism and infighting uh, and displeasure with Xi's leadership. Uh, I think that at present he is firmly in control, control and he's, uh, for the foreseeable future, he's likely to remain that way, um, unless, of course, we see unforeseen events. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make, uh, and this is, I'm mean, here, I sort of partially disagree with Bonnie, uh, is that I thought the description of the external environment uh, by both Xi and Li, it resonated with language of the past, yes, but it was extremely stark. There was less conversation about opportunities. Um, you know, in the past, uh, threat perceptions have been articulated, but along with that, they've been sort of tempered with articulations of opportunities. Uh, I thought that that wasn't necessarily the case as much uh, this time around. Um, and in contrast, obviously, Xi Jinping's speech at the end of the NPC did not at all talk about any sense of threat. It spoke about um, a sense of a moment of a new moment, a new beginning and opportunities for the party state. Um, so I, I thought that uh, at least in his uh, conversation with uh, the private sector folks that he had, uh, where he talked about, where he mentioned the US specifically, um, there was a far more stark language uh, without which did not was not tempered by the sense of opportunity that still exists. Um, and I think that is something that sort of gives me a sense that there's, there's a far more darker perception than there was even say six months ago with regard to where the external environment is for China. Um, these views are also reflected in uh, Foreign Minister Chin Gang's comments. Um, I thought that uh, his press conference was extremely interesting in that um, it it spent a lot of time and energy uh, on the United States and the relationship with the United States. Um, he was extremely blunt, um, but um, I didn't think that any of the language was uh, terribly new in terms of what's been the discourse in the Chinese domestic ecosystem for a long while. 
Um, it was far more direct, uh, less diplomatic than it has been in the past. Uh, but that, again, is a reflection of the threat perception. But I don't think it means any substantial shift in the policy direction. Uh, I think the policy direction is likely to remain the same uh, with the U.S. being the primary threat. Uh, uh, what I thought was also interesting about Xinjiang's press conference was that uh, he didn't necessarily address uh, other uh, actors in other parts of the world, for example, uh, my part of the world, India, um, there was not a question, there was no reference to it. Um, and given the fact that this is one of the relationships which has been on a downward spiral for nearly three years now. Um, so I, I thought that was interesting that there was still no reference to that. Um, although, yes, there was talk of a much more proactive foreign policy and which Pony has, I think, outlined uh, what have been the steps since then. Um, the third point that I would like to make is that um, in interactions with different delegations, some of the priorities that Xi Jinping highlighted, um, there was a lot of policy continuity, uh, although there has been structural change in terms of the institutional architecture. Um, but there was lots of policy continuity. Um, Xi Jinping talked about the two halves, um, food security uh, and, and, a, and a strong manufacturing sector. Um, those, I think, tell us a little bit about the policy priorities. Uh, you know, for the next couple of years, at least, which are critical. Uh, uh, and all of these are viewed from a lens of security. Um, in terms of food security, the two, uh, the dual sort of track of policy that he identified was on uh, seeds and land. Uh, and therefore, it's important for us to look at what are the kinds of changes uh, that, are, that we're going to see in those directions. Um, again, these are not new, but these are what were highlighted. Um, in terms of investments in the manufacturing sector and investments in R&D and core technologies, um, there's already been significant investment uh, in terms of as a percentage of GDP. Um, and I think we're likely to see some of that continue to be ramped up. So that's something to watch out for. Um, but the framework within which Xi Jinping talked about uh, these priorities was predominantly of self-reliance, resilience in supply chains. Um, and I think that's uh, more continuity than change. Um, fourth point that I had was in terms of uh, the rhetorical shift on the private sector. Um, um, Scott will be talking about the economy in much more detail, but briefly, um, to me, this is, again, continuity from, say, what we've seen since the Central Economic Work Conference in December last year um, and commentaries from the top leaders since January. Um, but, but to me, none of that imply, has implied a sort of return to an earlier times of loose, looser regulation uh, or any of that. Uh, I think that uh, in his engagement with the private sector folks, Xi Jinping talked about the private sector being part of the family. He talked about them needing to be bold and going on without, you know, ideological and other baggage. Um, but to me, it didn't sort of tie up the rest of the uh, things that he said didn't sort of reflect this idea that we're going to go back to this desire to search for profits and make breakthroughs, because uh, there was a reference to the idea that this is not a carte blanche. Uh, you're going to uh, be tempered, your, your ambitions are going to be tempered by greater regulation. That regulation will largely be around these ideas of high quality development and common prosperity. Um, in terms of high quality development, I think uh, environmental regulation uh, is, is one key component, and I don't think that's going to be eased. Um, uh, where capital goes, in which direction it goes, uh, I think the party will play a greater role in continuing to guide the direction of capital. Um, Xi Jinping also talked about private on entrepreneurs uh, under the framework of common prosperity, um, needing to strength strengthen the sense of family and country, um, build harmonious labor relations, and sh equitably share um, enterprise benefit. Um, he talked about the need to become for entrepreneurs to become role models when it comes to patriotism and so on and so forth, um, and also the idea that they must engage in charity. So to me, some of that regulation is likely uh, to temper this ambition, uh, and I and I don't think any of this rhetoric has yet uh, got the private sector excited and enthused, and we've not seen private sector investment, uh, you know, spike up dramatically, at least in the last couple of months. Um, the final point that I had was, and I think Bonnie uh, discussed this in much more detail than I had thought of, um, was around Taiwan. Um, uh, my sense was that, uh, you know, the tone around Taiwan was generally measured. There was much more uh, talk about the idea of peaceful reunification. I think there was a certain dialing down of temperatures. 
um, lest, of course, it was in the context of America's policy with regard to Taiwan. Um, so I, I, I think that there is at present some sort of an outreach uh, that, that you know, Bonnie sort of outlined. But yeah, we have to keep watching what happens from a security point of view. Um, be, beyond that, just the one last thing that I would add before I wrap up is um, from an Indian point of view, I think when people here have looked at the two sessions, uh, the sense has essentially been that uh, policy towards India in this region is unlikely to change, uh, despite the launch of new initiatives, despite being, uh, despite Xi Jinping uh, sort of engaging in a much more proactive foreign policy. Uh, I think that there is greater outreach to the global south, but it's not necessary that uh, China is going to be engaging in addressing the debt problems of countries in the, the global south far more willingly. It's going to hold its line on the need for multilateral uh, lenders to sort of play a bigger role and for other private lenders to play a bigger role and do their fair share. Uh, so it's not uh, sort of going back to the days where there's going to be easy money. Um, it's going to be, there's going to be much more policy continuity. And from a point of view of India, I think the uh, sense of uh, the relationship being in a downward spiral continues. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, we took away from the two sessions. So I'll wrap up with that. Scott. Terrific. Well, thanks so much. Well, I don't, I've got a little bit to add here uh, from the economic perspective of, of what happened. And I'm glad that what we've got is not only a diversity of topics we're covering, but a diversity of views, because it is really challenging to try and break down every little aspect of, of, uh, of the National People's Congress and the two sessions, particularly since uh, we're doing so uh, essentially from 7,000 or 8,000 miles away, or at least from outside China's borders most of the time. Let me say a little bit about what I think um, the leadership tried to do in the two sessions on the economic front in terms of ideas, personnel, and organization. And, uh, and then let me say a little bit about what uh, the reactions have been and are likely to be. And then uh, where where China's economy is likely to go and try and do that all uh, in five or six minutes. So in terms of ideas, you know, I do think that uh, given the consequences of the pandemic restrictions on China's economy and the crisis of confidence felt across Chinese society and from countries around the world, uh, what we did see in um, the government work report and then afterward uh, in speeches by Xi Jinping and Li Qiang's press conference is an emphasis on economic growth as being still important. And I focus on the qu quality economic growth, but they also mentioned the importance of a quantity as, as well. And that economic construction is still the core goal of uh, the party. At the same time, it's quite clear that they were not overturning the con the points made at the 20th Party Congress and that we've heard multiple times over the last decade uh, and increasingly over the last few years that security, uh, achieving security in a complex, dangerous world and in a world uh, in which there are potential domestic internal challenges to authority is also extremely important. Uh, and so uh, I think the emphasis on self-reliance, on dual circulation, which means an emphasis on generating growth domestically and depending less on international supply chains and international markets, uh, all highlight this emphasis on security, which in many ways is growth detracting. You also have continued to see an emphasis on what the Chinese call common prosperity or more egalitarianism and sharing uh, the wealth, uh, what, but what in some ways turns out to be a soak the rich campaign. Uh, and of course, the emphasis on, on climate and energy issues as well. So I, I still think that what we've seen, again, continuity uh, in that there is now a plurality, a multiplicity of goals that Xi Jinping is trying to achieve at the exact same time. And in, in you know regular Chinese fashion, uh, we may see the contradictions. Uh, they just see they're just trying to balance all these things and that it will work out. Um, the emphasis 
uh, yes, on the private sector, uh, but um, I think a lot of people were believing that those words were written with clenched teeth, that there is not a great genuine commitment uh, behind those words. On the personnel side, it sort of reflects sort of this mixed uh, motives. Uh, you saw the effort to keep on some significant uh, key policymakers uh, and economic technocrats from uh, the previous government, the heads of the central bank, the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Commerce, the heads of the China Securities Regulatory Commission, all kept their jobs. Um, in a, uh, but you also saw some significant changes. Uh, the architect of uh, in, uh, inserting financial discipline into this system, Liu He, who's also responsible for negotiating the phase one trade deal with the United States, uh, retired and replaced by He Li Feng as vice premier in charge of economic affairs. Uh, he Li Feng was just most recently the head of the National Development Reform Commission, China's planning agency, uh, and before that uh, served for a while in Tianjin. His career goes back mostly to Fujian, which is where he met Xi Jinping originally. And so he's not known as a very market-friendly person based on his history of what he's done recently. And if you just read the 14th five-year plan, that is not, a, you know, let's just let markets operate and fix things. So he brings a different character to the position. Uh, in addition, you see a variety of officials promoted who have uh, a significant experience in China's military industrial complex. Uh, and this is relatively new in terms of the amount of authority that they've been given. And we know that uh, there's integration of commercial and military and security interests under Xi Jinping, which accounts for the uh, great the promotion of these individuals, which will play who will play a very different role than economic sort of financial technocrats have played over the last uh, few decades. So that gives me a sense that this is not a return to the glory days of, of years past, but looks more like continuity and in fact further pushing uh, Xi Jinping's broader agenda organization, we see uh, more top-down, more centralization. Uh, on the financial side, uh, the, the central bank, uh, the People's Bank of China, has been made less powerful by the creation of the new uh, Central Financial Commission, a central a national financial work commission, uh, the upgrading of the posi bureaucratic position of the China Securities Regulatory Commission, uh, the PBOC was never an independent uh, central bank. It's got even less authority now. Uh, and I think if you're looking for some balance in this system where technocrats play a significant role in checking the leader's power, I think that's going to be harder going forward rather uh, than easier. I think the reforms of governance for science and technology, for social governance, to me, that looks, again, more Leninist, more top-down, less like allowing uh, innovation to flourish from the bottom up or civil society to flourish. Um, Li Qiang, the premier at his press conference, said that the job of the state council is to implement the party's policies, not make policy. And so to me, this suggests, although I agree with some of the specifics that Jamie pointed to with regard to individual components of the plan, to me, it looks like the party is at least playing a larger role, if not directly involved in, in everything. Uh, now, finally, what are the reactions that people have been giving? I think that uh, mixed reactions. In the short term, I do think you're seeing a, a, a revival of investment and economic activity, just being on the ground in, in China compared to what it was like uh, six months ago when I was here in the fall. There is a lot more uh, commercial activity, uh, traffic on the streets, subways are crowded. Uh, certainly the economy is off of its back. And so to hit 5%, I don't think that's going to be particularly hard given that 2022 was 
an economic disaster. Uh, just this may not mean anything. The air in Beijing today is hideous. And it wasn't when I was here before, and that's partly just simply luck of what happens day to day, but it's also the fact that the economy has been turned back on, right? Uh, and so the chances for this, uh, for the air being bad uh, is higher than it, than it was before. Um, I think multinationals uh, are uh, more interested in China. Yes, is deeply concerned about some of the direction that China is going and its tensions with the West. But I think a lot of multinationals who see a large market here uh, are not looking just to immediately depart. Uh, and next week, uh, China will host the China Development Forum, and we should see a, a few dozen CEOs from Western uh, multinationals here uh, to press their cause, uh, interact with Chinese officials in person for the first time in, in quite a while. They don't want to give up on the China market yet. But long term, uh, they are hedging their bets. They are diversifying their supply chain, splitting their China supply chain off from their global supply chain um, and prepared for uh, the worst. Um, in addition, even though it's a mixed bag, what we've seen out of the two sessions. I think uh, the US government, from what I can tell in their reading, is not doesn't come away uh, really reassured about the direction China is going in. In fact, I still think what you're seeing is the US, no matter what, continuing to press ahead uh, with its uh, efforts uh, with regard to strategic competition with China. In terms of sort of like an overall evaluation economically, and this is my final point, um, it's clear to me that you know, China faces four big challenges, debt, productivity, uh, going over a potential demographic cliff, and international tensions, all of which could massively restrict growth and force China into a middle income trap or a low middle income trap. Uh, I do think what we've seen out of the two sessions is certainly a focus on debt, and they're going to try and restrict uh, continued uh, expansion of debt, uh, although that's on the banking side. Uh, they have not figured out how to solve the debt, the fiscal problems of local governments, which is going to be critical. Uh, and at some point, China is going to need property taxes, income, personal income taxes to make a much greater share of revenue. Uh, and they've not tackled that here, although they might. On the productivity side, it's all about investment in shiny, shiny things, uh, much less investment and focus on broad-based education, which is really critical to developing the human cap capital necessary for long-term growth. Demography, um, they are talking about extending the retirement age a little bit, but not really fundamentally changing their approach. And on the international side, I see nothing in China's language which suggests they are going to try and really reduce, make take major steps to reduce the tensions with the West. So I think that means we're going to continue to see a gradual pulling apart in, in high tech in, in areas which have been critical to Chinese growth overall. So I think what we're in for is uh, some bumpy times ahead economically, domestically in China and between China and the rest of the world. Uh, let me turn things over to Jude, who will clean up and fix all any of the mistakes I made and, and, and expand on the great points of the previous speakers, and then he'll moderate the Q&A and, 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 and lead us out to the end. Jude? Thanks, Scott. Um, and just for the audience to know, I'm doing a very precarious Wi-Fi hotspot uh, because the internet is out. So I'm actually going to move into Q&A because I don't trust my signal here. Um, and I wanted to direct the first question, Jamie, to you actually, um, and ask if you could elaborate a little bit more on your comments on um, the uh, some of this party state division of labor that has been a key dynamic and tension uh, over the last several decades of reform and opening. Um, I was, I'd maybe lean a little bit more towards the Scott diagnosis, um, but I would like to be challenged on this. Um, help us understand a little bit more um, why, why you see that this was, um, we still see critical elements of state council. I don't wanna call it autonomy, 
Um, but at least why that division of labor remains and remains real. And let me give you a counter example. In the restructuring of the Ministry of Science and Technology, there was the creation of this new commission on science and technology, which is a Communist Party commission. And it was designed to, quote, strengthen the Communist Party's leadership over since science and technology. So uh, on the one hand, of course, the Ministry of Science and Technology is very important. Um, but then you see the installation of a commission within most, which is designed to increase Communist Party leadership. And so, you know, my own take is I wonder at what point does it not does the distinction lack a bit of difference if if the Communist Party has installed these this leadership capacity over and across the entire state council, does that division of labor still hold true? But again, I, 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 you've, you've thought about this for a very long time and quite deeply, so I'd love to just hear your thoughts. For those of us a little bit skeptical, why does the state council still matter? Okay, thanks, Jude, very much for giving me some more time to discuss this. It's a, obviously a very complicated question, and I did mention most now being made the, the working office you know, as a ministry of a party entity. But I think it boils down to with all these issues of what is the role of the party, whether it's in state institutions or private companies, is we should really look at hard evidence. I've tried to analyze from a legal and political point of view what they're doing. What does party leadership mean? You know, how is it leading? Is leadership really control? And that to me is really the critical question. You know, they changed the party charter back in, I think, 2018. They changed the, the definition. Party leadership used to clearly be political leadership, you know, not interfering in the making of decisions, you know, whether it's by companies or state institutions. But they changed it just to mean something general, I mean, that had no content. So I think we have to look at how do things work in practice? And again, whether looking at what is the actual impact of party committees and private companies? What is the actual impact of having a party commission oversee? you know, or lead or guide a, a state institution. And I think it's very different from merging the state institution because then it clearly is a party entity. Um, so I've done a look at like the National Supervision Commission, which was set up in 2018 as supposedly a state organ that was gonna take over the state function of anti-corruption. But in fact, it really is just and co-located with the same website, everything, you know, with the party Central Discipline Inspection Commission. And so I've always said it's not independent at all. It's not really a state organ. It's just the facade. The same thing with the Cyberspace Administration of China. It acts like a state regulator. It puts out rules. It solicits public comment. But it's not. It's a party entity. It's very opaque. We don't know what its org structure is. We don't know what it does with these ideas. And you can't sue it or challenge it. At least I've found no evidence that anybody ever has. So it raises concerns. And then we've seen what it's been doing just this last week, two examples in its work on you know, cross-border data flows too. It, there was an interference with access to bond pricing data. And then now this big academic database has notified people it's cutting off service for a while because the Cyberspace Administration of China is conducting a data security review. Um, so that's an example of the party entity in practice uh, and Chinese scholars are struggling to you know, figure out how do we make it accountable within that administrative law system. So that's kind of a unique case of a, merger, a merged entity, which I think is very problematic. But again, what we saw this time, and why? Why did the party choose not to simply merge everything? Why do they bother to have a state stru you know, structure? In some cases, they, they keep state names of entities for you know, external purposes, because they interact with international counterparts or whatever. And in other cases, they make other arrangements. Clearly, they see a difference in these different arrangements as well. But my main thing is, again, let's look and see how this all operates. You know, don't jump to conclusions. They've taken over everything. All these individuals loyal to Xi, they're now being dropped into the state bureaucracy and they have bureaucratic interests to, to follow too. So you have those dual loyalties to party and Xi, but also you're expected to deliver on economic development, on tech innovation, on social stability or whatever it is. And how do you do that? 
So you're under pressure to be much more pragmatic about it. Um, you know, the party's making a big push now. You may have seen yesterday, there was a big announcement about, you know, they're doing a big research and go to the grassroots to do a better job of getting out and finding out what do the people really care about? What do they concern? You know, so it's a way of finding other channels to get the feedback loop that we're all afraid she is not getting or allowing to go into the central decision making. Um, so I still see, you know, in the ordinary course, you deal with the state council. I deal with, you know, Chinese officials, party officials working on these regulatory issues of how do you make government run? How do you do good governance? And they're worried about all the same issues we are. There's, there's this, that's why I call it, there's a normal state operating. There's great attention being paid in the NPC to doing better laws, to being more responsive, to addressing the real needs of the people going forward. So I think the state structure is important in the fact they're transparent, they have to issue more you know, public information, they have websites, the policy decisions, there's an interactive process. You know, like people may not know, the NPC, I think, is the only national legislature in the world that regularly solicits public input on draft laws, and usually two times. And foreigners, in fact, the US government often puts in comments to it. You know, does it make an impact? Often not, but sometimes it does. And we have seen changes and you can track them because it's more transparent between drafts. So I think the whole state dynamic is still important. That's why I say the state holds. It's under pressure to develop traditional state goals and results. And while it has to be loyal to the party, it's also got these other important issues to work out and to handle. And so again, the different devices the party uses to exercise its leadership, I think are important. It impacts how these entities behave and how the public can interact with them. And again, interesting, they took this data piece out from what was really under the Cyberspace Administration China, put it into the state structure. We'll have to see who they put in charge of that, right? And maybe it's gonna be a party guy, you know, with strong party ties, and then we'll know kind of where the reporting lines go. But it still is going to have to deliver on this desire to figure out how to better develop, utilize, share, and protect data, which is so fundamental to what China sees as the new economy, the digital economy that they're putting a lot of you know, eggs in that basket on. So it's not clear, but I still think you know, for all these reasons that we still have a state structure that we can deal with. They may not always be able to, even the People's Bank of China as good as those guys were, you know, the major decisions were all decided by the party and they had their hands tied. But again, in ordinary course, and except for some of these, these issues, day to day, you know, they are given a certain amount, if not autonomy, at least space in which to make and implement. Implementing policy often can mean making policy too, as we know, because the policies they're implementing are incredibly vague and broad, and they have to be, you know, made more specific and carried out and all the way down to the grassroots level as well. Great, thank you, Jamie. Um, questions now I have for Bonnie and, and Manoj. And Manoj, I'll start with you. Um, and then Bonnie, I wanted to ask you a slight modulation. Manoj, um, a question here is about um, the China-Russia relationship. Um, I wonder if you can give us a sense of what the discourse in India is. I know you're in Bangalore, but I'm also appointing you our official New Delhi whisperer. Um, can you give us a sense of what the strategic discussion in New Delhi is on watching this China-Russia relationship? Um, uh, and especially in light of the state visit now, and now we just learned, this morning learned that Xi Jinping has invited Putin on a state visit um, to, uh, to Beijing. Um, and, and I think a sub question is, how is the tightening China-Russia relationship if it's seen that way, affecting uh, New Delhi's view of its relationship with uh, with Russia. Um, do you see any larger strategic shifts underway in terms of uh, that might tear even more at the um, at, at the uh, India-Russia relationship? All right, so tough question. Uh, I think that, uh, look, there is anxiety. Uh, I think that there is anxiety and there is a, a much more closer attention being paid to this than at any other point of time uh, that I can remember. Um, last year, once uh, soon after the war began, the Indian parliament had a debate on the war in Ukraine. 
Um, and I encourage people to go and look at that debate. Um, uh, you will see for the first time there was discussion in Parliament about this relationship and what it means for India. I don't think that there are clear answers as yet. I think that the view in Delhi is that there's a lot of fluidity. Um, India is valuable to Russia, just as Russia is valuable to India, uh, in particularly from the point of view of the continental security dynamic that India faces from Central Asia to Afghanistan to Iran, um, and the relationship with China and Russia and what that's going to do to that dynamic. Um, so, uh, and I think that India views its role India, India believes that, you know, that from a Russian point of view, India is valuable as a balancer also with regard to Russia's relationship with China. Um, so I, I think that there's a complex dynamic there, but I don't think that simply uh, the deepening relationship is seen as a zero-sum game, that if this relationship deepens, then uh, we are going to be entering a split with Russia. Um, what it's seen is that, yes, because the deepening of the relationship of Russia and China, it's going to create greater vulnerabilities for India, and therefore we need to find ways in which we reduce our dependence on Russia. Um, and that has meant, particularly from a defense point of view, has, been to, has meant a closer relationship with the United States, with European partners, uh, with France. Um, and I think this has been a process over the past 20 years. If you see India's defense dependency on Russia, it's actually reduced over the past 20 years. And this is a process in which it will continue to reduce. The challenge for India historically has been uh, who shares technology with us, who shares technology with us. Uh, and uh, with the signing of the ICET with the US in January, um, I think there is hope that as that relationship deepens, you'll see uh, less sort of dependency on Russia, which makes it much, which makes the sort of broader environment much more secure for India. But I don't think that anybody should be looking at the India-Russia relationship and anticipating a split, um, uh, because I think there is much more to the relationship than just uh, the defense relationship. Trade is not significant. It's risen in the last year because of uh, oil and gas. But I don't think that that's also the driving factor. The driving factor is India's perceptions with regard to continental security in Central Asia uh, with Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, and that's, I think, a key component of it. And Russia is a key player in that. Um, so I think that you don't, we won't see a split, but yes, you will see reduced dependency and you will see as the China-Russia relationship intensifies and as China's uh, as India's threat perception with China uh, continues to deepen, um, you will see greater concern about whether Russia will be a reliable defense supplier, particularly if India and China enter into some sort of a conflict situation. Um, so all those anxieties exist. Uh, and therefore, what you're seeing is uh, India trying to expand its options and reduce its dependence on Russia. But that will not mean a split in the relationship. Ani, I wanted to follow up on Manoj's comments. Um, you know, here in the U.S., it still seems that the debate, um, a large part of it is describing the, the Sino-Russia relationship as, as a kind of one of tensions. Um, you know, others are describing what China has tried to do as a kind of a split or a straddle between supporting Russia, but also not trying to alienate uh, relations in Europe. Um, I wonder how you see this, you know, especially in light of we had Wang Yi visiting um, in in Moscow uh, just on the on the basically the anniversary of uh, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Whether or not Beijing understood the symbolism of that, I don't know, but it it, it wasn't lost on many of many of us. You now have this very warm state visit where the the, the footage coming out of this shows Xi Jinping very relaxed. Um, you know, the two of them seem to have some sort of, you know, rapport and relationship that that uh, has not apparently diminished. Um, the New York Times has an article today about how China has prov been providing drones to Russia over the last year. And now, of course, you have the invitation from Putin um, to to visit Beijing on, on a state visit. Um, so can you take stock of how you see the relationship having been affected over the last year? Where do you come down on this? debate about, you know, is this a uh, a new axis of evil or, or is this a strained marriage? Um, any of your th any thoughts on on the above? Thanks, Jude. I don't think it's a strained marriage. I don't quite think it's an axis of evil yet, but it's definitely an axis that's growing closer uh, and closer. Um, in addition to all the points that you mentioned, I would add that when you look at what in addition to sort of the optics, um, I think it's important that what Xi Jinping and what the Chinese media have been portraying is that Russia was the first place that Xi Jinping visited in 2013 as the president of China. And 10 years later, 
Xi is back there again during his third term. So China is trying to portray that the, the close bond between the two countries is not impacted by events such as Ukraine or other events. It's a trend in which China has been continuing and that, that relationship has been growing. I would also note that mm. I found it interesting that she made comments about how uh, about Putin's 2024 election and how the Russian people were, will support Putin. So I took that to mean that she wants Putin to be in power mm. and will also support Putin. So if, if you link all that together with the growth in trade in uh, China-Russia relations with all the news articles coming out, it seems like the relationship is really only going to deepen moving forward. And even if they're not calling themselves <clears throat> an alliance, it seems that given the dark security environment that we've been talking about, China's assessment of where the United States is vis-a-vis -vis competition with China, we kind of have to view China and Russia as quasi-allies. Um, in terms of their overall positioning. I don't necessarily think that means that, for example, in a conflict, we would necessarily assume that Russia would militarily support China. But short of that, I think most aspects of a strong strategic partnership, <clears throat> semi-quasi-alliance is all, um, more or less there already. Thanks, Bonnie. Yeah, and, and I have just been struck in watching Chinese television, not just the not, she, not the main news program, but some of the public affairs programming, um, how extraordinarily pro-Russia that the slant is, but, but also by virtue of it being very openly um, US hostile. All the opinion shows, I was just watching them over the past week. I was in Asia, so it was a better time zone for me to, to, to um, tune in on this. And, and I took about 48 screenshots of some of these shows because, um, the framing is just incredibly, incredibly dark on, on the United States, and, and I'm sure that, um, that that helps ease the relationship with Russia from the Beijing perspective. Um, Scott, I wanted to turn to you now uh, and ask um, to, to have some further elaboration on the, the effect that personnel will have on policy. Let me just start with a key position. You mentioned this briefly, but I wonder if you can unpack this. Um, uh, uh, talking about Li Chang as premier and what effect Xi Jinping having now a deputy who he clearly trusts a great more, uh, a great deal more than he did Li Keqiang might might have for economic policy. There is an argument out there that actually the premiership might actually be elevated in terms of its de facto um, guidance of economic policy because Xi Jinping has addressed it, a, a trusted deputy or as the new york times i think put it very well in a story um you know empowered premier with xi jinping's breath on his neck um but i wonder if you could talk a bit more about how you think lee in particular how much um how much leeway will he have over policy making over the next five years and do you think this will mean a substantive shift in terms of the office of the premier back to what we have seen, you know, sort of pre Li Keqiang. Yeah. So th this is really uh, a, a big question, which we're, we don't have a, a definitive answer right now. We're going to have to see how uh, it plays out. And one reason that we don't have an answer is, as you know, better than absolutely anybody, how non-transparent elite Chinese politics is and why it is that Li Qiang was made premier and what, uh, if anything, uh, Xi Jinping promised him or in, in the other direction uh, mm -hmm. is, is that we really have very little genuine insight into how uh, all of this uh, went down before the 20th Party Congress and, and then uh, how things were put together. Uh, it's really uh, people here in China seem to know much less about elite politics than they used to. And it was always in some ways a rumor mill or guessing game or and 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 reading tea leaves. And it's just there are fewer tea leaves to read. Uh, so so that's the first thing that we just need to admit uh, our humility in trying to make judgments on this. The second, though, is, you know, uh, this is uh, Xi Jinping and Li Chang. It's not the uh, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, or Li Peng, Zhu Rongji, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin. Uh, it's clear there is a leader and there is a follower. 
here, that there is not a just a natural division of labor, one on party and military affairs and, or, or, and security and one on sort of ex economic domestic governance. It's 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 everybody knows who the one person is, who who is boss and what he says uh, is most most important, not absolutely important, but but more. Um, Li Qiang, will he be able to I, uh, take more initiative? It's possible. But if you look at what happened in Shang, you know, and people say what they'll point to, there's sort of two Li Qiangs. There is the party secretary of Shanghai who courted foreign investment for several mm -hmm. years and helped improve Shanghai's economy, work with multinationals. Uh, and uh, there's that Li Qiang. Then there's the Li Qiang of the lockdown, particularly uh, last March, April, May, who did exactly what he was ordered to do, even though it caused major suffering far beyond what was necessary in Shanghai because he was loyal and he wanted this job. At least that's people's uh, saying. And so he will, if, if which Li Qiang is it? Uh, is it more like the former or, or, or the latter? We'll have to see. But at the, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to be implementing uh, the de decisions that at the are chosen by Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping may not be the initiator of all those ideas and and the options, but Li Chang is, I don't think, going to be a maverick and just totally freelancing. Uh, Li Keqiang, who he is replacing, and I guess to be premier, you need to have the, a character Li and a character Chiang in your name. And if you've got any others, that's fine too. So we know what the, down the road it's going to be uh, some other Li Li uh, with a Chiang in there. But in any case, um, uh, Li Keqiang uh, clearly had different views in Xi Jinping uh, and pushed back on and had a variety of pet initiatives, including promoting uh, small, medium sized enterprises, micro enterprises. Uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, boost growth in certain areas. Uh, but he got a lot of pushback uh, from uh, Xi Jinping. And I think, in, you know, in the last uh, few weeks of of his uh, premiership, he seemed like going on a, a tour uh, was kind of crestfallen. Um, you know, I don't see Li Qiang looking to venture out uh, that way. I, th I think that would be risky for his uh, career uh, to, to try something like that. So I, I expect a much closer towing of the line. Broadly speaking, I'm also worried about the collection of information and whether or not Xi Jinping has all the right evidence and the leadership has all the right evidence to make best decisions. So I, I'm concerned about not just the specific individuals, but the system in which they operate that maybe disincentivizes their willingness to, to, to give Xi Jinping bad news. Great, thank you. Um, I got a question here, which actually tracks very closely to something I've been wondering about. And I might, Bonnie Minoj, this might be a question for, for both of you. Bonnie, at the end of your remarks, you mentioned that the 7.2% defense budget increase um, was a sign of, or at least uh, an indirect uh, uh, link to this worsening security environment from Beijing's perspective. The question is, um, which again, I, I, I puzzled through as well, why only 7.2%? Uh, because that's, you know, that's below where defense spending was in 2019. So you had a, a COVID dip. Um, and now, you know, the headlines have been, this is the fastest you know, increase in four years. Well, of course, the four years were COVID. So that's not a surprise. But given the framing of the external environment, given Xi Jinping's remarks uh, during the MPC, given the language that we saw at the 20th Party Congress, um, and, and given, you know, the, the growing discourse on encirclement, Cold War small groupings, um, why do you think we didn't see a, a bigger rise in defense spending, or is that not the right place to be looking for a manifestation of Beijing's anxieties? Sure, thank you, Judah. Happy to offer some initial comments and then for Manoj to add more or correct what I say. I think there are two things. First is we, we have to take whatever China says is their official defense budget increase with a grain of salt. That has typically been an underestimation of how much money China actually spends on defense. The second thing is that when we look at the uh, number, um, 
uh, China has always tried to th think about the defense budget relative to uh, uh, actual GDP growth. And now the defense budget growth is higher, uh, two percentage points higher than GDP growth. And that wasn't the case when we look back five or six years ago when it was much closer uh, in that. Um, and related to that, we started seeing a couple years back um, concerns uh, which the PLA was addressing, saying that you know spending on defense was actually for the good of the country. It wasn't taking away from social spending or other spending requirements. So I wouldn't be surprised that regardless of what the actual spending level was at, China was cognizant of not increasing the official level of defense spending to be too much than last year because of the concern of um, that it might be viewed as taking away from other spending that might be more needed domestically. Manoj, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, look, if this if there was a moment for China to do a much higher defense budget increase publicly, uh, this was a good moment to do it. Um, you know, India's defense budget went up by 13%. Japan's defense budget went up by 26%. Um, so, th so there was a moment to make that change. I don't think, I mean, I agree with what Bonnie said. Uh, there's a domestic imperative there, but there's also an external narrative imperative uh, where you're trying to make the argument to the rest of the world that look, uh, what we're doing is much more peaceful. It's in line with our growth as opposed to something else. Uh, and, and we aren't necessarily uh, hunkering for war or conflict. It's the others. Uh, and look at what they're doing. Uh, they're trying to contain us, whereas we're looking at development diplomacy. Mm -hmm. so it's part of also a narrative contest, which you're reaching out to countries in the global south and your neighbors uh, while you're doing what you want to do. And of course, while you can take the official pronouncement of budget increases with a grain of salt. Jamie, it looks like you get the, the final question here, um, which is thinking about the restructurings we saw in 2018 um, and then looking at, at the restructuring uh, this year, what do you think is left on Xi Jinping's docket for unfinished business in terms of an administrative or governance reforms? Um, of course, at plenary sessions, you can often, you know, plenums, you can often see big reforms announced like we did with the third plenum uh, on uh, market reforms, which we're still waiting for 10 years later. But um, what do you think sort of still hangs out there that that Beijing or the Xi administration feels that it still you know, needs to tackle in terms of governance or administrative loopholes or gaps? Well, thank you for that question. I mean, in terms of remember all those rumors that were flying before the Congress about other reforms. One was to reestablish an internal affairs commission with the Ministry of Public Security and State Security under it and beef up the police state. Um, so I think there's still a huge sort of internal security concern. Um, but in terms of whether they're going to actually move on that, you know, who knows? We didn't talk much about this new commission that they did establish instead, which is the Central Social Work Department. Uh, and it's a very secretive thing, took people by surprise. Uh, it you know, seems to be everything related to grassroots interaction, including the petition part, et cetera. So we're not really sure what they're, but what it's all about. But there does seem to be, in Xi's mind, a great focus on even as we talk about, he's you know centralizing stuff around him. We're worried about information flow. Clearly, a big effort to get out and find out what are the real questions that people are worried about. Um, I understand, you know, from people who work in the courts and the bureaucracy, et cetera. There's a great sense of social discontent. You know, Xin Fang and Shen Su and Ju Bao and all these complaint mechanisms are getting flooded. Uh, a real desire to try and address what's going on among the people. Um, so they'll have to try and figure out how to handle that. I mean, some of the big, from the economic financial point of view, reforms that people think China needs to make, including was already mentioned, raising the retirement age, which for decades they've talked about, haven't been able to do. Another is imposing a property tax to give local governments, you know, reasonable uh, you know, revenue base. Um, but when I talked to, you know, and even the Chinese colleagues who thought that centralizing power around Xi might be good because you streamlined the process now to really address the tough issues. But when you say, well, what tough issues are, is he going to be able to address? You know, you don't get much of an answer. At least I haven't yet. Um, on property tax, it seems like, no, that's off the table. So I don't really know or I can't predict what more, what the next big reforms are um, from a governance point of view at this, this point. Um, but what I do see is this real increased 
focus now on trying to figure out how to address the grassroots thing, you know, through economic development, but, but other mechanisms as well. Um, and I've been wondering, you know, thinking more about party state in this context, whether in some ways the party sees the state structure as a useful front man. <laughs> Remember during COVID, she was sort of in the background a lot. He wasn't up front until they, you know, declared victory. And you know, it was all this joint mechanism, which was under the state. And it was Vice Premier Swin and others, not she out in front. You know, Lee Chong, you're right. But it was, remember, she was flown in and the party kind of took over in Shanghai. And so I don't know how much, you know, certainly Lee Chong, it wasn't his decision. Um, but even now, leaving the Petitions Bureau, which is going to be subject to this new Central Work Commission, it's implementing a party, right? The party took over the regulatory effort and issued a big party regulation on this petitioning, which now includes not just government, but the party, SOEs, and all the state organs. But it kept the state, you know, Petitions Bureau and upgraded its administrative authority to keep that state face out there to be trying to handle these petition issues. So, um, you know, I see maybe in a way this is another aspect to why the state still holds in a way, because they're the ones that they're supposed to be taking the heat for these things. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid I can't give you any predictions into the next governance reforms that we might see coming beyond those thoughts. Yeah, thanks. And I realize it's an unfair question in the age of Xi Jinping to ask for, <laughs> for predictions. Um, and I'm also struck, Jamie, I appreciate your really great comments. Um, it, it may be it's a follow-on event we need to do about, you know, uh, where and how does the state council matter? Because I find myself deeply conflicted um, on this. Uh, on, uh, because of course, much of what you said is you're right. The state council operates functionally different and with uh, more transparency. But on the other, the other side of my brain goes, but who cares when you have this leader, you know, strengthened party leadership system over all of it, um, which is vastly more you know, de jure and de facto authority and organizational, you know, integrity and top level design and centralized leadership. But but I admit that these are questions that require, you know, continued discussion. Um, we're two minutes over time. And of course, I just noticed my internet just came back on. Xfinity just managed mm. to fix it just as we're um, just as we're bringing this in for a landing. But I'm, I, I think the signal held here. But when I think um, all of our speakers for just some really excellent insights. Um, I feel that the NPCs are actually getting more interesting under Xi Jinping um, <laughs> than they were 10 years ago, where I felt like you could basically just look to see what the growth target was um, and then yada, yada, yada through it. But now this has become a really important um, benchmark, uh, way station, and point of, of you know, um, in an increasingly opaque system, one of the moments when it's really important to stop and listen to see the signals. Um, but in the diversity of opinions we've heard here, it's also an indication that uh, a lot of these signals um, have multiple interpretations. So um, uh, great to have such uh, thoughtful analysts joining us today to, to try to read some of these signals. Um, so uh, on behalf of uh, our three uh, CSS programs, trustee chair, China Power and Freeman chair, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, I want to thank Jamie and, and Manoj uh, for, for joining. I want to thank Scott, who is up far later than uh, he should be at close to 11 o'clock p.m. Beijing time. Um, so look forward to seeing everyone at a future CSIS event and, and hope everyone has a really, uh, a really great week. Thank you. Thank you.